Patrick. So um, we've got Claude Lorenz, who's sort of still quite well known in terms of really sort of arguing for some fundamental change in the way that we think about our housing. And um, John Sinclair Brown. Um, I don't know how you're going. Both on stage at once. Claude? Good Welcome, Claude and John. So my name is Claude Lewens, and I have two hats. Um, I do work with John in building what are called mobile homes or also tiny homes, and um, those are just basically very short-term solutions to the housing crisis that we're facing right now because you can build them in two weeks and you can um, install them in two hours and uh, they don't require a building consent so that they are uh, an immediate solution. But my primary passion is changing how we build communities. Um, and for that, uh, we, uh, when I started, I wrote a book, which is available if people are interested, calling it How to Build a Village. But we now have pretty much rebranded it uh, to call it a market town, which is a thousand year old concept of uh, basically creating communities based on a local economy. Today's presentation uh, is actually focused uh, directed at Kainga Ora. I don't know whether Mark Fraser or Andrew Booker, are you still in the room or was it just yesterday? So the value of this will be the video that's being made because uh, we've been involved with uh, when it was called UDA, Urban Development Authority, starting with the early submissions when it was Andre Anderson, uh, with MB uh, walking it through. We see that as the only way we can change things rapidly in New Zealand. Uh, what I want to cover is uh, what a market town is and then how to do it. And I see my role as not as a developer, but hopefully working on the uh, getting involved with the Kainga Ora side so that perhaps there'll be people in this room who can bring forth the solutions that are required. Because one of the elements of it is that it's a 10,000 population community. And it's based on a local economy, and therefore you need everybody to move in in a relatively same time. And what that means is you cannot use traditional building methods to put up 4,000 houses, which will be townhouses, three floors, like you see in old Europe. Uh, you're going to need real innovation with that. And what I've done is I've gone out and found a solution, not the solution. So for example, I went to Germany, I met with Perlhofer Consulting, they said yes, for 18 million euros you can set up an on-site factory and you can uh, build 4,000 uh, three-story buildings um, in less than one year. Um, is that the answer? No, you probably have the answer here. We may have just heard it, um, but uh, I found an answer so I knew it was feasible. So let me start in now with the uh, slides. Um, <clears throat> the first one is that it was always very difficult to find out why we build communities. And what we found finally was that Aristotle had given us the answer. He said when uh, several villages come together um, uh, to form a town, they do so to enable people to enjoy a good life. And Victor Popanek defined that as conviviality, citizenship, artistic, intellectual, and spiritual growth. And that is the best definition I've found. It's probably better than to enable people and communities to provide for their social, cultural, economic well-being while uh, protecting and preserving the environment, which is the purpose of the RMA. Um, so what we find is this doesn't exist anymore except some towns in old Europe, and they have the local economy problem. And therefore, if we want to do it, we're going to have to build it. In New Zealand is where we need to build it, and to do that we need the Urban Development Authority in Kainga Ora, because if we try and go through the conventional methods, it will take, I'll be long dead and gone before we've gotten it through the RMA. Now, recently we've heard from uh, Greta, who's been saying, how dare you, and all of the politicians listened and actually started getting uncomfortable about uh, climate change. Well, the most obvious way to address this is stop driving. Eliminate the need to drive. Now, I know that if you go to a New Zealander and say, I'm taking your car away, he'll kill you. But if you say, I'm going to eliminate the need for you to drive, and your car is going to gather dust to the point you go, why am I spending money on this thing? That works. So what we have here are two sets of commuters. They both take 30 minutes to get to and from their job. The first group is Auckland. We know that one well. 
John had to fight that same queue this morning, come from the North Shore. But the other was a town in Italy, and it took them 30 minutes to get home, even though their, their home was only two minutes away, because in the central plaza, they started talking to each other, and this conversation went on and on and on. And uh, that's what happens when you live in a car-free environment. Now, eliminating the need to drive is about locating your buildings. Don't move people. Move destinations. Look at, we right now do 10 movements a day, and those are home to work, home to school, home to shopping, home to um, going out you know, with your friends. But everything is separated by cars, and you end up with this ridiculous infrastructure that's Los Angeles. And right now, New Zealand is still, with the Auckland model, looking at building another Los Angeles. You know, we need more motorways. No, let's try and take our 10 movements per day and cut them down to less than one. So the timeless pedestrian model has been in use for thousands of years, ever since we started building villages, got to stop being nomads. The automobile experiment is less than 100 years old. As we've seen, it doesn't work. It's a disaster. In order to make this work, you have to have a local economy. If you walk to work, your jobs have to be uh, local. Now, to do that, you have to have 20% of your, um, your jobs, or what's called local to global. Today, so many of us use the internet, and we could be located anywhere in the world. I live on Waiheke Island. We have a lot of people who are running major operations. The guy, for example, who figures out the bank exchange rate all over the world. He's, he's, he's based in Europe, but he does his work out of Waiheke Island. And uh, those people will move anywhere in the world, but why would they move to New Zealand? Because we are the most attractive place in the world to live. We've got a great climate. We have the biggest moat in the world, so we're quite protected. Um, we uh, have a real outdoor life, and uh, we, have, we speak English, and we use common law, and we're relatively uncorrupt. So we have a lot of attractive features, but not enough yet. And what the market town does is it makes it attractive for people. And you, once you have those 20% of the jobs who are selling local to global, they're the ones bringing the money in. You then have 200 job types, barbers, butchers, baristas, uh, 200 job types where the money circulates locally. And the critical element there is to make sure that those job types are not franchises that suck the money back out of the community. Because any time you have a business that wires money to Seattle at midnight, that's less money in your community. And so you need a five times turn of that money when it comes in before it leaves. And that's a crucial element in this. So basically, the town is based on market capitalism, which is why it's called a market town. Now, in order to attract people, you have to make it attractive. And to do that, one of the, most, one of the elements in the research we found was that the village plaza was one of the most important parts of a community. And it has several public buildings that meet that conviviality, citizenship, artistic, intellectual, and spiritual growth. So you build a cafe on the plaza, and you have it owned by the 200 houses in that particular village. That adds $5 a week to your mortgage. You then go to a proprietor, say, we'll lease you this for a dollar a year, provided your price of coffee reflects the fact you're not paying any rent, and the community feels that the food you're selling is both nutritious and very flavorful. And so you create a gathering point, which is about conviviality. That's where people meet. Our plaza on Waiheke Island is Fuller's Ferry. We have the tables. We connect with people. We don't have an appointment. It's extremely social, and it is not done on a cell phone. Um, you then have the schools on the, the primary schools on the village plaza. For thousands of years, long before we had schools, children are hardwired to learn by observing and interacting with adults. When we isolate them in segregated campuses, where we have huge concentration of them segregated further by age, we create an abnormal living environment, and the kids don't learn how to become adults. You can have exactly the same curriculum. It can be public school. It can, everything can be the same, teachers, grades, 
but put it on the village plaza and have big windows so the kids are observing adults going about their daily life, and you'll have an educational system that works. There won't be bullying. There'll be far more interaction. As the kids get older, the adults will say, look, I've got a job if you want to work after school. Uh, there's a pathway to becoming an adult. And this is the way humans have been wired for thousands of years. Um, in addition, you put uh, a nursing care facility on each village plaza. And what that means is you go from cradle to death because the most traumatic thing for old people is when they're put in a nursing home. It's overheated, the people there are screaming, some of them are crazy, the staff is underpaid, overworked. And it's, it, we're gonna look back at this in a few generations the way right now our generation is looking back at slavery. It's a horrible thing we're doing to old people. So build the nursing home on the plaza. They can be wheeled out in the wheelchair. They do not suffer the trauma of leaving their community, and it costs a lot less. And then finally, for cultural enrichment, on each plaza you build an artist guild hall. And I don't care what they are, musicians, painters, engineers, inventors, doesn't matter. But that's called the creative class, and what it does is it makes a community much more culturally um, enriched. Now, I spoke briefly about the children, and basically uh, it is something that you want your children to be free-range children, that they can have free run of a town, and the parents aren't afraid they're going to get abducted, bullied, all the other, you know, sort of thing. And I'm going to show you in the design later on that the whole town is surrounded by a green belt. And that green belt is so that children can experience real nature. They can fall out of trees. They can go fishing. They can have these sorts of things that I had as a kid, but is no longer available except in the countryside of New Zealand and places like Waikiki Island. The social and cultural en enrichment is especially important for people uh, who haven't started families yet and they need to interact with each other and you have to make it extremely attractive for them. And one of the ways this is done is that there are 20 different villages in all side by side. And there will be some that are designed to be very trendy, that they will be attracting single people, people who have a high social uh, need. There'll be others that are designed for families. There are others designed for I mean, I could really imagine in New Zealand that we have an artist's village that is uh, go to Peter Jackson and say, let's make a filmmaker's village. And just have everybody in the filmmaker industry living in one, one community. Uh, the person who proposed that said you put bolts on the exterior, the, the, the cladding, and one day you walk in and the whole thing's a film set of Victorian England. You come back two weeks later and it's Wild West because they changed the cladding. I think it's a very cool idea. I know that would work, but um, I, I, I loved it. Um, now, old people, as I talked about, very important that we design for them. Why? Because I'm 68. John's even a little older than me. And that's a big driving force for us. I don't want to go to a nursing home or a retirement home. I just, it, it, and I, everybody I talk to who's my age, the same thing. No way. We want to interact with young people. We want to be part of a community. To do that, you start by building on the ground floor special homes that are basically made for older people. They're much simpler and they're designed to um, uh, basically accommodate for needs when people are older. Then the next stage, as I said, if you do need nursing care, you move 200 meters to the uh, nursing care on the, on the plaza. The crucial part is when you stop driving, it doesn't matter because nobody is driving. The urban core is car free and therefore there's no change. The streetscapes, basically, as soon as you take the cars away, people become paramount. And what I observed time and time again in old Europe was that the people would interact with each other without an appointment. And I just took a camera and went and took pictures in Italy uh, to write this book. And uh, I just saw these patterns repeat again and again and again. The only problem in Europe was their economies were failing and therefore they didn't have the money coming in and so the young people left and would move to the big cities. That is what we changed by basing it on a local economy. Now this is the design. Obviously it's not going to look like that, but I'm using a simple CAD program. I'm not uh, um, talented to this and I'd love to have somebody who is. But basically what you see here, um, get my pointer out is in the middle, you have the cosmopolitan town center. 
And the Cosmopolitan Town Center has four-story buildings. It's, it's a little bit more formal. It has the largest plaza where everybody can gather. And then around it, you have these 20 clusters, which I'm simply calling villages. And each of those has about 500 people in it. And the reason for this is that the social number is 250 to 750 people, but the economic number is 5,000 to 10,000. So if you have an average of 500 people in a community, they know each other, they support each other, and you need much less demand on government when things go wrong. People take care of each other, they look after each other. But if you wanna have a self-supporting economy, you need five to 10,000 people. As you see, surrounding it is a green belt. And that green belt has multiple activities in it, but the primary one is nobody lives there. And so you can have food growing. Uh, two hectares and $10 million will give you a vanadium battery solar grid so that uh, you're completely off the grid electrically. Um, you collect your, you harvest your own rainwater. You use in, in, in California, uh, when they were in the middle of the drought, they had me do a study that showed that with seven and a half inches of rain, which was the record low they had, you could convert a vineyard into a 10,000 population town and using orbital system showers and taking the washers and dryers out of every house and having a free laundromat instead, you could actually run a town with no water shortages of seven and a half inches. What is that in metric? About 200 mil. Uh, per year of rain. So you have water storage and processing. Um, the key thing you have then is you have a motor pool uh, in the front, and that's where all the cars get parked. Uh, you also will have rental cars. So, you know, nowadays with electric, it'll just be cars that you take when you need to rather than own. But if you need to bring your Ferrari, that's not a problem. Uh, you just pay to park it. Um, then you have a walk to industrial park because it's crucial that you have blue collar work as well as white collar. This is a complete, not elite community. And uh, to do that, you have to ensure that there are jobs for everybody. Now we get to the prefab bit, and that is that you need 4,000 three-story buildings to go up in 12 months. That's quite a challenge in New Zealand. People will tell, tell you you're crazy. In Germany or in China, they'll go, yeah, that's, that's nothing unusual with that at all. Um, and so we would be, and the reason it's not done in New Zealand is who places an order for 4,000 houses at the same time? Doesn't happen very often. Now, the answer to that is that you build, um, sorry, I'm gonna jump here. You build a pop-up factory. You don't wanna have to get zoning for industrial because it's only gonna be there for a year to two years, something like that. It takes about three weeks to put one of these up. It takes about six months to put all the machinery in, and then you run it 24-7, uh, three shifts a day, 500 workers total, 50 managers total, and you use uh, computerized types of design so that it doesn't look cookie cutter. So each one has a lot of variability to it. And each village has determined its own design code. So personally, I prefer this Palladian style but other people really want to have the type that was talked about earlier of the sort of modern glass, you know, very um, contemporary look. Doesn't really matter. All you do is determine what your village is going to look like, and then um, the factory will build those. So, um, and actually, I'll jump back here a bit. There are four pillars of shelter that are always discussed. We know all about health, safety, durability, and affordability, although affordability is not part of the Building Act and it does need to be put in because you have to have a three times uh, ratio between earnings and house value, not 10 times that we have in New Zealand. We have to come in that the cheapest property you can buy is an apartment for 200,000 and the medium house price in Auckland has to be 500,000, not the silly prices we're having now. And to do that, you have to change how we get the land and then you have to change how we make the houses and you have to get a lot of bureaucracy and red tape out of it. So I put a fifth principle is it really needs to be beautiful. And that's the eye of the beholder, but let's make sure it's a basic principle of it. So implementation. First of all, each of the 20 villages is its own job site. So you're not building 4,000 houses, you're building 200, and you've got 20 projects running simultaneously, all supplied by one factory. You make sure that the um, 
there, the factory is on the same property, so you can tow an eight meter wide building down the street without encountering any LTSA problems. Um, and the core to make this thing happen is what was called the Urban Development Authority back when Andre Anderson started working on it in 2017. It's now become called Cayenga Ora. And of course, that's a reference to uh, the Treaty of Waitangi, which guarantees all New Zealanders the right of Fenua land, Kayanga village, and um, Taonga Katoa, which is basically anything of value that is not um, land or um, village. And so it's crucial that we use that uh, new legislation in order to empower this. I'm not a developer and I'm not particularly interested in learning that at my age. What I want to be is on the empowerment side where it comes to people like it comes to people like you and basically says, okay, here's what we're trying to accomplish. We'd like to have you get involved. Now the key thing is that the Civitas company is the term we're using for who the coordinating organization would be that it would take highly talented people, put them in charge of this, and basically say, here's your mission, you have to build this, here's your budget. Uh, we need about 10% pre-funding, and then what we need to do is pre-sell all of the housing in these villages, and then use that so that the 4,000 buyers diffuse the risk in um, this. That's gonna require financing using mortgage-backed securities funded by pension funds, insurance funds, sovereign funds, or the Chinese have told us they're ready to give us the money any day. Um, so it's a, quite an opportunity for people because it is a bit of an open slate. My goal is to get it done rather than decide how it's done. There's a lot of talent in the world and um, some of it may be in this room. Thank you, and now I guess we'll take questions. And John, do you wanna first make any comments? <clears throat> Uh, yes, John Brown. I have been supporting Claude in this, uh, in this vision for years now and have listened to many presentations. And I totally support his vision. Uh, the only problem is to get enough support to go out there and make it happen. In the meantime, we are working on providing affordable accommodation in the, a small form, as in cottages and um, cabins and pods which we are currently producing in Silverdale and we've just gone to a much larger facility where we can do uh, on scale uh, a much larger quantity per week or per month to provide affordable accommodation which is where Claude and I work together to try and achieve a result immediately um, which is uh, the biggest necessity right now to literally pro provide affordable accommodation because it, it, it's, it is just not available, as you're probably well aware. And that is an immediate need, which we are working on together. But I support 100% Claude's vision, and the only way this vision will become reality is to get other people to support it as well, because it's a very ambitious project, which requires a lot of support um, from the right people and I think that Claude's got it absolutely right that we need to put it out there to the business world and the community to say, get in behind this as a concept and it'll become reality. Questions for both gentlemen? Uh, could, I, could you just uh, share with us, have you spoken to any uh, city council or regional authorities about your idea and how are they uh, receiving them? Yeah, we uh, uh, said when Andre Anderson was writing the UDA, I met with him and uh, he communicated, got my book to uh, Phil Twyford, and we saw that realistically nothing was going to happen until we had this central authority capable of doing it. Uh, I, for example, think that down in the uh, King Seat or Caraca area would be an ideal first place. But if we're trying to work through the unitary plan to do that, it's just not structured to do it. And uh, in speaking with Auckland Council authorities, uh, they actually would welcome the heat, if you will, being taken from a central government perspective. Um, 
How about any private uh, developers? Uh, yesterday we have a gentleman from uh, MAKE. He was uh, uh, mounting the idea of uh, some, something similar to yours, but on a private sector uh, basis. Have you spoken with any investors uh, on that? Yeah, we have uh, one gentleman who I won't discuss who he is, but uh, he, he, he's Chinese and extremely powerful and extremely well connected. And you'd certainly know his project because it's one of the biggest in the world. Um, and he said, you know, come talk to me anytime. Uh, we also have found that uh, the sovereign funds and the retirement funds, such as new superannuation, may be good candidates for this. Um, in the developer range, uh, it, the developers who are most interested are the ones who have been there, done that, and now feel they want to start giving back, that they don't want to extract every dollar. Because one of the elements of this is if the house sells for 500, the cost is going to be 400,000. And what we want to do is retain the 100,000 in a fund that the community then owns, and it uses to invest in businesses to move in. So you bring a business in and we say, well, do you need financing or venture capital? And if we loan you the money, we have what's called the day team, the dollar a year people. These are retired executives, super successful, who said, I've made my money, pay me a dollar, that's all I need, but I don't want to just play golf. I really want to help younger businesses. Yeah. So you have spoken to many of the old rich, so to speak? We have. Um, and the old rich, the new rich. Uh, but as a developer, I wouldn't be the one to do it. I know my limitations. And what I've done here is to put it all down. And none of these are my ideas. What I did is I collected all of the good ideas I could find and put them into a single position. But ultimately now, half of the job of a developer is getting permission. I'm sure anybody who's in the business knows it, that permission is, is, the, is the biggest difficulty. It's not that hard to actually develop a piece of property. So we have to break that. And that's where Kayanga Aura comes in, that if it can give the permission, and if I can be involved in saying, here's the concept. Now, the plan that has been written was taken from the village plan down in the Queenstown Lakes District Council. So it's already been written. The, the, everything's been done to that level of detail. What we now need to do is get them behind it, and then the money will come and the talent will come. We have some colleagues from there, uh, from Queenstown <laughs> like Council, plus uh, some of the uh, stakeholders, investors, and all that. Well, thank you. W would you have any view on that? Hamish? <laughs> Hamish? <laughs> well, we wouldn't see our plan as being um, overly. Uh, rapid in terms of development you know they've, they've got challenges down there but um, certainly uh, many developments have made use of the special housing areas that have um, that the legislation allowed for so yeah hopefully the new agency does provide another pathway for um, for that planning process to be reduced yeah. it was the jack's point uh, part of the district plan that was extremely well written and it took very little adaptation to uh, turn that into a generic uh, one because that was obviously written for John Darby's particular property. Here what you want to do is start by saying this is the concept let's go out and find the land whereas in New Zealand the typical is I have land here's the concept council will you approve it. So we want to turn that upside down and say to Kainga Ora here's the concept now let's go find land, and there is tons of land out there. It's the fact that the district plans, except for Queenstown, never actually wrote, you know, language for it. All right. Okay, a short question. <laughs> it, it's actually not really a question. I just was, um, sorry, Richard Quilter, I'm at um, Kanga Ora, and uh, I, I, I was really, um, uh, fascinated by what you said actually and I thought it was an excellent presentation um, ten years ago I would have said your utopian dream is yes. you know a pie in the sky uh, I actually probably think it's the way forward now and uh, I, I sit on the accessibility uh, working group at Kangora which is just newly formed I'm really proud to sit on that I'm 53 but I'm planning for my retirement so um, 
you know and i agree you know the horror of being uh you know cast out of a, a of a society or a, or a town that you you know a, a a community and sort of um you know put out to pasture in older age can't be uh, appealing for anybody facing that especially you know we're seeing these things these statistics from japan of people what do they call it lonely death or something where, where yeah. you know where people are you know dying alone and uh, you know it's a horrendous thing so I would like to uh, talk to you further but I I, I really did enjoy uh, what you said about the um, about how we integrate uh, and keep older people and younger people within a community I mean I come from Great Britain you can probably tell from my accent um, and and so we we have a long uh, um, history of building these sort of market garden um, towns and experimenting um, I've always um, uh, um, been much more uh, an advocate for uh, organic growth of a uh, of a town uh, rather than the engineered approach um, that you advocate. But I, um, I think my my thinking has changed over the last few years, and we as a as a as an authority have to uh, look at um, policies that uh, that create these environments and. We have to get rid of this hideous reliance of the car in New Zealand, yep. because it's actually shaped the 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 social fabric. Um, I'm used to going to the pub on a Friday night after work and getting the bus home. That you know that just doesn't happen here. Um, so society has has sort of changed. You know, changed. People get home and go out close to home, if indeed they go out at all. But it's you know it it, it culturally it's very different. Yeah. And the car dominates. Absolutely, um, it takes twenty minutes to cross the main road in Auckland um, because <laughs> the car has so much uh, priority over. Um, you know, I'm prone to jaywalking. Okay, I'll shut up. Thank you. Well, th thank you, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And I yeah. want to comment that yes, England. Uh, uh, Simon Conabare, who uh, did Poundbury, was one of the people I visited in 2000. That's a Prince Charles project. Uh, the downside there they found was they tried to tame the car. And they said, you can't do it. You have to actually, they're wild beasts and you have to block them out with big fences. Uh, they also found to their surprise that these big homes they built were, built were purchased by people 65 years old who had had successful careers. Husband and wife would move down to a five bedroom, fill it with a lifetime collection of furniture and art and have the extra bedrooms for the grandkids that came down. And the reason was they hadn't done the local economy planning. If you don't have jobs, you're not going to get any further. And so the English model was a very important one, but the reason I favored the Italian for New Zealand is because we have an Italian climate. We don't have an English climate. So we can live outdoors more than half of the year, and we should be taking advantage of that. But I have a card. Um, you'll see the business, my company's called The Company Limited. I like pretty generic things. But um, one thing I uh, did want to comment there, I agree that organic growth is good. And the way we chose to do that was that you have to attract the buyers before you begin building, and they have to participate in the design code. Because when we examined growth, we found it was not the elapsed time that gave it, it was that the decision maker would live there. And therefore, they would say, I'm going to spend $5,000 on a front door the developer goes, hey, it's $200 for front door, or if it's a luxury, it's 500. And the guy says, no, I want a $5,000 door because I'm gonna walk in and out of that. And that personality implanted on the village is what enables you to do it in a rapid growth. So it is possible, and yes, I was very concerned about it. All right, on that note, thank you very much, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, just an after note, uh, John here owns a, a factory uh, building a modular, mo a modular homes on wheels. So to, if anyone is interested to find out more, I can talk to you later on, right? Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. Well, you're gonna get a book anyway. Now should I give you several prints to distribute to different people? Oh. Yes. yes, good idea. Thank you, um, Claude and John, for that.